Okay, welcome to another 8-Bit Bytes episode where we take a peek at machines from our collection that I think are interesting and worth checking out a bit. So last episode, I showed you a vintage, completely homebrew Z80 computer from around 1977 or so. It was a pretty cool looking device put together piece by piece by its owner. That machine was pretty primitive in both look and design, but it could output video directly, which is no minor feat. This machine is about 5 or 6 years newer and is much, much more capable in most respects. Originally I thought this was a complete homebrew job, albeit a very well done one, but more on that later. This machine is actually two devices in one box. In the back we have a wire wrapped Z80 computer. In the front we have an Atronix FastVid terminal. Quite honestly when I first bid on this thing I was more interested in the keyboard and the terminal than I was in the actual computer. I have a few Neutronics pieces including an ELF 2 that this keyboard and terminal were designed to work with. But once I got the machine home I realized it was way too nice to part out and only needed a replacement RAM chip and a couple of TTL chips on the terminal board to be functional again. It's kind of a curious mix of technology. Now I initially said that I thought this was a really well done one-off and it was certainly possible. I've got a few custom jobs in our collection including this ZX81 in a wood case and no this will be in a future episode. If you've got some decent woodworking and metalsmithing skills and know how to apply dry transfer lettering nice and straight you can create something that looks very professional. However I'm pretty sure this one isn't for the simple reason that several months after buying this one yet another of these machines showed up on eBay and it was pretty much the exact same setup. Although a few details were changed like the arrangement of the Z80 chips and the Pontiac Firebird Disco Dash treatment around the keyboard. But other than that, this seems to be pretty much identical. And then, months later, another one shows up. And this one is identical in pretty much every way. Which leads me to believe that this may have been a professionally offered kit of some kind. Maybe a feature in an electronics magazine article or a small company selling these in the back pages. The inclusion of an Atronix terminal is an interesting choice, but probably there's a simple explanation. Simplicity. It's not easy to build a computer with direct video output out of wire wrap. As I learned from experience, getting a quote unquote video card built from scratch to work, to sync right with your monitor and produce stable legible characters is pretty involved. If my hunch is right, the maker of these kits was maybe targeting a more moderately skilled segment of the hobbyist market that just wanted a functional computer that they could build themselves without too much trouble. It's a lot easier to create a wire wrap Z80 machine that uses serial communications and then just bundle in a terminal for it to connect to. Let's take a tour of the machine itself and then we'll fire it up and I'll show you some of its features and er, eccentricities. So along the back here we have an array of useful ports. We've got a couple of AC plugs for accessories, one live and the other activated with the power switch. We've then got what looks like a DIN plug for television. I didn't see anything resembling an RF modulator on the board, but I do see wires coming off that disappear underneath to somewhere. We've got a... well, it's supposed to be a serial port, but it's kind of installed backwards. But yeah, the actual connector part is missing. I'm not sure what's up with that. And of course we have a composite video out port. That is wired up to the terminal up front. We've also got something the earlier homebrew machine lacked, a tape in and tape out port. I see these are also wired into the Z80 board, so I'm hopeful that that means that this machine can save and load from tape. That would make this a much more useful machine for sure. The older Z80 didn't appear to have any means whatsoever of storing programs anywhere at all. The case has these nice wood sides. They kind of look like oak. They've provided a nice slide off smoked Lexan cover, which allows easy access to the internals, including the power supply, which is completely open. So there's a little bit of thought going into the design here. Yeah, I always unplug this machine when I'm working in there. Way too easy to make contact with that power supply, and I don't really feel like meeting my maker right now. I haven't had time to prepare an explanation for all the dumb stuff I've done yet. So here's the Z80 computer itself. It's on this nice blue colored breadboard, and it is wire wrap, not point to point. It's got much higher density RAM chips than the earlier Z80 had. Two 8K chips for a total of 16K. Still not a ton, but a heck of a lot more useful than one half of a kilobyte. This machine has a much more functional monitor ROM called TOS, or at least that's what the label says, which is in no relation whatsoever to the similarly named Atari OS. And then the machine also has what appears to be a variant of Microsoft Basic. Up front here we have the Neutronic Source keyboard. These were a favorite of late 70s hobbyists, especially those in the ELF scene. 
I believe Matronix first offered this kit alongside their Elf 2, which was a Cosmac Elf on steroids. It usually came in a blue Natronics case like this one, and could be the keyboard by itself, or actually have a serial terminal board, usually the Natronics FastFid terminal installed directly underneath it, just like this. The keyboards are highly collectible today and go for hundreds of dollars sometimes. Around the keyboard we have an array of switches, including reset, two switches labeled mode, a pulse switch, and four input port switches. I haven't really figured out what the mode switches do, it seems to be that they switch sort of between basic and other functions of the computer. From looking at the wiring, including some loose wires and the unfinished RS-232 port at back, I kind of think this machine was designed to be operable either as a Z80 computer or just a standalone terminal. I've messed around with the switches and don't notice much of a change in behavior except in one setting where the computer no longer talks to the terminal. There are four input port switches that, when you change them, seem to change what the machine does, perhaps which memory address the machine starts running ROM code at. And yeah, underneath the keyboard we have an Atronix FastVid 64 terminal board. This was a kit board offered for general serial terminal use with just about any serial-based computer. It can do 32 or 64 characters in regular reverse video, right now it's set to 32, and these modes are selectable from a series of dip switches. It also has graphics characters of your own design, and you can program and install a second ROM. This terminal seems to be able to do up to 9600 baud, but it looks like the computer is configured only for 300. Yuck. Come to think of it, the graphics are something that really threw me off with this machine. According to the limited information I could find out about the terminal online, usually the EEPROM socket on the left is used by default for text, or your character generator, and the socket on the right is normally used for graphics. You can switch between them by using Control a but for some reason, the text EEPROM, or character generator, is installed in the right socket in this unit. I discovered this after a few hours of troubleshooting. When I would power up the machine initially, I got these blocks instead of text. I wasn't exactly sure if that was caused by the computer malfunctioning or the UART on board creating gibberish on screen. Anyway, I found I could get text, albeit backwards, by moving the ROM into the correct socket. But I could not get it to display with the correct orientation. It was only when I discovered the Control a key sequence that I discovered that I had to do that on power-up in order to be able to use the text mode. I'm not really sure why this is. I'm guessing it's just the way the character set is formatted. The machine has to be in graphics mode to display it properly. Now back to these switches for a moment. When you turn the machine on, initially there's nothing on screen. You have to set your input switches first, and then do a reset, and then flip the pulse switch up and down. I'm not really sure why it's set up this way. As I speculated earlier, I think the input switches set up which EEPROM to execute code from and where in memory to start, or something. For example, if I set the switches like this and then hit reset and pulse, and then hit control A, I get what I think is a monitor program of some sort. If I set the switches like this though and then hit reset and pulse, I get basic. However, if I set them like this and hit reset and pulse, That's not all. If we change a couple of input switches here and then do reset and pulse again. <laughs> I mean, Jingle Bells and Mary Had a Little Lamb, well, there you have it. One of the first digital music players. A little big for your pocket, though. Yeah, I'm not sure why you'd use up EEPROM space to have the first few and the last bar of Jingle Bells on tap, but whatever floats your boat. I can just picture an 80s Christmas with this going on endlessly in the background and a very annoyed spouse in the foreground. Anyway, let's have a tour through the monitor, shall we? Okay, so this is weird. First, I have to change the input switches to even get here. And then when I do, I get this P, which is interesting. It kind of lets me enter something in which I assume is a memory address, but when I hit enter, yeah, it just tries to output some kind of tape sound. I'm thinking this is the equivalent to the punch command used in earlier machines like the Southwest 6800. When you use that command on the 6800, it acts as though you're punching out to a teletype tape, or a cassette if you had the audio encoder box. It doesn't seem to let me change commands though. Hmm. Ah, weird. Okay, so switching these switches gets me another letter. I have no idea what's going on here though. This is a really, really strange monitor, Ron. Maybe something's malfunctioning, I'm not 100% sure. I'm assuming these letters at the left mean the function or whatever it's trying to do, but heck if I know what. It doesn't make sense to me that you'd have to use these input switches and hit reset just to access different commands. That would definitely be a bit of a step backward in design. 
I decided to dump the EEPROM, and for anybody curious, I've decided to post a link to the bin and hex files that resulted, in case anybody wants to go through there and sort of see what this is. Maybe this is something that's recognizable and, and came from a hobbyist group or a magazine or something like that. It's a 2732 EEPROM, and it's only about half full, and it's labeled TOS or TOS 4 15. As I've said in other videos, I'm not really a great programmer. I kind of think these gaps of FF, which are basically empty space, might be where the monitor is separated from the two music tracks. There might even be something else on there that I don't know about. Hard to say, but I'll put the dumps up anyway and you can check it out if you're curious. I won't dump the basic on that one though, as I'm not really sure about copyright, and I'm sure it pretty much exists everywhere anyway. Okay, moving along, we have an adaptation of Microsoft Basic. Looks like we only have about 10 kilobytes of 16 free. But that's the cost of having Jingle Bells immediately available, I guess. You can see too, there's something sort of loose in this system. Every time I type, it's like there's some kind of a, almost like a voltage drop. And we lose brightness, or parts of the text of the screen become malformed. Yeah, I really gotta get into this thing and figure out what's going on. Okay, so I just took the machine apart, and it looks like basically it was what I was thinking. The ground wire for the composite video was a bit loose and frayed, and actually there were only a few little strands of wire actually making contact, so I fixed that. And then the ground wire that was going to the video board was actually touching the metal down below. I don't know if that has an effect or not, but I've kind of bent it up and it seems to be working fine now. So BASIC works pretty much like it does on any other machine, I guess. I'm pretty sure it's a version of Microsoft BASIC, and I'm pretty sure it has access to pretty much all of the standard commands that Microsoft used to provide. We'll do the good old number counting for next loop for a test. The one drawback of a serial-based computer, of course, is that you usually cannot dynamically control the screen. So certain types of games and displays aren't possible because the computer has to put out characters serially, line by line. There's also the annoyance of not being able to dynamically delete things. For example, if I make a typo here, and then I try to delete backwards, it looks like it accepts my changes. But then look what happens when I try to run it. Okay, let's list it out. Yeah, the terminal and the computer don't seem to have a way of deleting things. Now, there's probably a key sequence here that we need, and I'm going to have to look that up, but for now, I'll just sort of get by without it. Now, let's see if we can save anything to tape and successfully retrieve it. I'll just try the save command to see if it's valid. Yep, that's valid. Check that out, it's actually producing the tones for the cassette on the speaker. That's actually kind of handy, because you can tell that it's actually doing something as it's doing it. So yeah, I think this thing could totally write to tape. Let's set up this cassette recorder here, and then we'll rewind this tape, and then let's see what happens. Okay, so first we need to hit record and play on the recorder and let it get into the tape a little bit. Now we type save. If this is like other Microsoft Basics, there's no use of file names like on the Commodore. You basically have to keep track of the tape position via the counter and then just sort of know where your program is. Okay, a little rewind. And then we'll hit play. Yeah, boss! That's a tone! Okay, so let's power off and power on again and then we can go back into Basic and try to load my program from scratch. All right, here we go with the load command. Nice! Okay, so it actually works. Love when that happens. That means this machine is at least somewhat usable. <laughs> okay, let's go a little further. I'll try programming something serious here and we'll see if the machine can handle it. Why don't we try loading in Hangman here? This is a version featured in David Al's Basic Computer Games book. I'm choosing it in part because it's relatively short compared to some of the other programs in the book, and I'm hoping that its limited graphics mean that it'll get along with this serial terminal. I'll just test the first few lines here to see if the display will work properly in serial mode. I believe these games were written mostly with Microsoft Basic in mind, but I'm not sure on that. I do love typing on this keyboard, even if some of the keys are in slightly strange places, and even if it destabilizes the entire machine in the process. Definitely something funky going on with that Natronics terminal, but the keyboard's nice anyway. Okay, wow, so yeah, that took a long time. <laughs> Not having a backspace key sucks. And the bucker of it is, I eventually remembered that on many terminals, the backspace function is actually performed by control H. Oh, that would have been nice to have before I got into a couple hundred lines of programming. Ugh. Anyways, in giving the program a run, I'm confronted immediately with a problem. I don't see anything in the offending line that shouldn't work, so either we're dealing with a fundamental incompatibility between this basic and the basic used in the Hangman game, or maybe the machine is taking issue with the way things are formatted. 
In following the listing, I was putting spaces in after the colon, and I know some machines are kind of sticklers about that. Let's try taking one out and see what happens. Yeah, okay, so it carried on until it hit the next line like that. Alright, my legs are killing me. It took me almost an hour and a half to enter that program. This is why I wasn't big on doing this when I was a kid. We'll save it and then I'll come back to it later. So I went back to load from tape and yeah, I got robbed. The computer duped me. It's my own fault. I've been into vintage computing long enough now to know that you cannot trust 30 year old equipment. To my credit though, I at least tried testing the saving function first. So I'm not sure what's going on, whether it's just something wrong with the tape read circuit or the tape write circuit or the RAM or something else. But basically anything over a few lines of code gets totally corrupted as it's loaded back in and does, well, stuff like this. Now, I thought I'd get clever here and use my old ThinkPad 380 to cheat a little and send an entire basic program as a text file over serial connection and then swap the original terminal back in to actually run the program. After all, this computer is serial based, so in theory it should talk to any serial based terminal, right? Wrong. I've set this kind of thing up hundreds of times and even have this little breakout box to help figure things out, but for the life of me, I could not get it to work properly. I'd reset the computer and I'd get the memory size prompt, so I know receiving is working, but the computer was not answering any keystrokes. I thought maybe it wasn't interpreting enter properly, so I tried the control key equivalents, but they didn't work either. I could see data leaving the terminal and coming back, but yeah, no reaction. So yeah, I decided after much grousing to just re-enter the fool thing. And let me tell you, it was a dicey affair all the way. I don't think this computer has been run this long at a stretch in decades. Every now and again the terminal would mess up and inject bad characters into my program lines, and then I'd have errors. When I got close to being done, the terminal really began wigging out and dumping whole lines of random characters on screen, which then got entered into the program. I spent a full half hour re-entering several lines over and over again trying to get them correct while fighting the terminal's efforts to sabotage everything. Anyway, in the end I finally won out through sheer stubbornness. And here it is. <laughs> and yeah, it actually seems to work fine for the most part. It even draws the hangman with some degree of accuracy too. Sad that I can't save and play it later. I did save it anyway though, just in case it turns out to be the load circuit having an issue. Then I can hopefully play it again. Okay, so yeah, this pretty much covers it. This isn't a very powerful computer overall and cannot easily do graphics. And like a grumpy old man, it doesn't always play nice. But I think for its time it was a pretty nice kit and was targeted more at the casual electronics tinkerer rather than someone with an expert level knowledge of electronics. Someone who wanted a little experience building their own machine but working safely between the guardrails of a very well designed kit. I am hoping one day to figure out how to switch between the computer and terminal mode. I would love to be able to, without removing the terminal from the computer, use the Natronics terminal to interface with my other Natronics gear. That would make this machine a certified twofer. Anyway, that's it for this video and thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, do hit subscribe and click on notifications and then you'll be alerted to new videos as they come out.